Okay. Shalom, everyone. Good afternoon. Today is May 6th, and we are here, wherever here is, in Houston, Texas, for our weekly Lunch and Learn. This week, Parshat Emor. And uh, before we begin, I want to let everyone know that today's class is sponsored by Jillian and Mike Davis in memory of Mike's mother, Rose Sarah Davis of Blessed Memory, whose yurt site was yesterday. And we thank them for sponsoring the class. And I'm also happy to remind you that if you are interested in sponsoring any of the Lunch and Learns or any other of the shul programs that we're having on Zoom, sponsorship opportunities are available and welcomed. As you know, the shul has been unable to bring in regular sources of income like aliyot or sponsorships of kiddush or sudash lishit or breakfasts. So we're hoping that we will be able to sponsor classes. So we're very grateful to Jillian and Mike Davis for this. And uh, anyone else interested, please let me know. Okay, so let's, uh, let's study. I have a source sheet uh, that I'm going to uh, put up on the on the screen for you all. And uh, once I do that, then I will uh, talk, uh, give a brief introduction. Okay, uh, let's see. Ellie, thumbs up. Can you see the source sheet? Excellent, okay. It should say Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch. If you're seeing something else, then something terrible has happened. Okay, um, so uh, today we're gonna discuss a uh, really beautiful idea which is mentioned by Rabbi, which is uh, articulated by Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch. Uh, but just a, a few notes of background. <clears throat> uh, after the first day of, uh, of Pesach, a carbon is brought, which is called the Karban HaOmer. And um, that carbon is brought, like I said, after the first day uh, of Pesach. This carbon, however, uh, was not, uh, was, was not, done while the Jewish people were in the Midbar, while the Jewish people were in the desert walking from Egypt, traveling from Egypt to Eretz Yisrael. Only after they entered into Eretz Yisrael, this is a key point of the, uh, of the discussion, only after B'nai Yisrael entered into Eretz Yisrael, which is when they had to start uh, engaging in agricultural work, did this, uh, did this uh, mitzvah of bringing the Karban HaOmer uh, become uh, actionable. Uh, so before we look at the sheet, I will show you the, um, the, uh, the, the Pasuk that talks about entering Eretz, Eretz Israel. It says uh, as, uh, as follows, everyone, uh, could everyone see the Pesukim? Leviticus 23 on the screen, okay. So we'll start over here, verse nine. Ve'edber Hashem Moshe Limor, Daber B'nei Yisrael, God spoke to Moshe saying, speak unto the Israelite people and say to them, Ki tavo el when you enter the land that I am giving to you and you reap its harvest, et you reap its harvest, et et omer you shall bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. So you see here explicitly that this karban ha'omer, this offering, only was given once B'nai Yisrael entered into uh, Eretz Yisrael. That is also the day that we, that Svirat Omer. that's why it's called Svirat Omer. right? It's counting uh, from that day of the Omer. Uh, it's, we count from that day, right? From uh, the, the, from uh, the first day of Pesach, right? The, 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 sorry, the second day of Pesach. We start counting all the way to Shavuot, and those are the psukim that we have here. Usfartem lachem mi macharat shabbat mi yom haviachem et omer hatnufa sheva shabbatot timimot tihiyana. And from the day on which you bring the sheaf elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath. You shall count off seven weeks. They must be complete. Ad mi macharat hashabbat hashrit tzibruch hamishem yom. You must count until the day after the seventh week, fifty days. Be kravtem mincha chadashal Hashem. And then another carbon uh, is another carbon is brought. 
Okay, so those are the psukim uh, that we are going to focus on. So Rav Shamson Rafael Hirsch here, I have a lot of tabs open, so it's hard for me to find the right one right away. Excuse me, there we go. Rav Samson Rafael Hirsch sees a very um, important point uh, made in the fact that we that the, the Omer counting starts after the first day of Pesach, okay? And that's point one, right? That the, the Omer counting starts after the first day of Pesach and that it only happens once the Jewish people entered into Eretz Yisrael, okay? Only once the people entered Eretz Yisrael and started agricultural work. So again, two uh, conditions needed uh, to uh, fulfill the mitzvah of, uh, of counting. One is after Pesach, the day after Pesach. Two, only once B'nai Yisrael entered into Eretz Yisrael. And based on that, Rabbi Samson Farrell Hurst says a number of beautiful things. Let's read together uh, what he says. We're going to start uh, right up here. It says, so that, so that. Mimacharat HaShavat. I'm sorry. Zach, you have a question? Yes, I think that it's three conditions, Rabbi. What is missing? He's supposed to start agricultural activities. Correct, correct. But presumably that started right away when they entered into Eretz Israel. But yes, there has to be agricultural activities. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so that, says Rav Hirsch, Mimacharat HaShabbat, when you have not only celebrated the festival of your attained freedom, but you have also brought to your mind before God the fact of your independence gained by possession and enjoyment of one's own land. So Rav Hirsch uh, notes that doing this mitzvah only after Pesach has started and only once you entered into the land of Israel, those two things are not just singular events, they represent status changes in the life of the Jewish people. One is freedom, obviously. So by starting the count only once Pesach has started on the second day of Pesach, we have firmly in our minds that we have attained our national freedom. And we have, all, not only have we attained our national freedom, we have also uh, are enjoying possession of our land and not only possession of our land, but as Zach said, enjoyment of the agricultural bounty of the land. So two, Two things have been achieved already. One, our national freedom. Two, uh, having our own land. And Rav Hirsch says that for many people, that would be enough, right? What else do we want from life other than freedom and financial independence, right? Think about the situation we're in now, right? We don't have our freedom entirely. And for many people, financial independence is a shaky proposition. Uh, nationally, it's a shaky proposition. So we all have this in our headspace uh, as well. I, I want to say to the cantors that a couple that studies separately stays together. I love that you guys are, are in different rooms. Okay. Um, okay, so... Um, but to my parents, I will say, a couple that studies together stays together. So everybody wins. Okay, so, uh, so Rav Hirsch here is saying that for many people, that's all we want, right? That's who, who wouldn't feel satisfied knowing that we have our, our liberty and financial freedom. But Rav Hirsch says that's not enough for us. And then he goes on to say, after you have liberty, and after you've attained your uh, financial independence by prosperity in the land, then, then, then you start to count. That's when life starts to count because there's something else coming up. He says, so that you are conscious of both these possessions, freedom and prosperity, which in general are the aims which all national desires and all national efforts are directed, right? That's what we want, not only individually, but nationally to attain, then you are to consider yourself not at the goal, 
but only at the beginning of your national destiny. That's so beautiful, right? That's not the, the those are not the, the, that's not the end. Those are means to an end, right? The, the, the end is the Torah. And so we start counting from Pesach Tashuvuot all after these two things are in place, not because they represent the apex of our accomplishments, but because they represent the beginning of the ability to count towards something greater. So he says, generally speaking, this is the aims of national desires, but then you are to consider yourself not at the goal, but only at the beginning of your national destiny, and only then begin to count for the acquisition of another goal. Thus, this command to count is expressed in Devarim and Deuteronomy, when the sickle begins at the standing corn, begin thou to count. Meaning, and here our first is focusing on the word beginning. While others leave off their counting, you begin your counting. While other nations would say, okay, we've achieved liberty and we've achieved prosperity, we're done. We say, no, those are not uh, the real measures of our success. The real measures of our success are the acquisition of another goal, and that is the Torah. And I think that this idea is actually very consistent with uh, the Rambam in his Mor Nebuchim. The Rambam talks about uh, what's more important, uh, spiritual excellence and perfection or physical excellence and perfection. And he says spiritual excellence and perfection is more important. I mean, spiritual excellence and perfection is more important. But first, what we have to achieve first is physical, meaning we have to have peace, we have to have prosperity, and we have to have calm in the land, and we have to have security, because only once you have those things, then you could try to attain, then you could seek out spiritual perfection. It's actually a very interesting way of looking at the idea of prosperity in and of itself. Prosperity in and of itself is a tool, is a means, uh, to achieve a greater end, in this case, uh, spiritual connection to God, and in the case of Rob Hirsch, uh, the ability to, uh, to receive the Torah. So that's, that's Rob Hirsch's first point. I'll just recap it, and then I'll see if there are any, any comments. The fact that the counting of the Omer can only be done on the second day of Pesach, when we have internalized our liberty, and only once we've entered into Eretz Yisrael, when we have achieved prosperity, that may be a signal for us to stop our uh, 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 attempt to attain goals. But says Rav Hirsch, no, then we have to begin counting. And we begin counting uh, towards the, the Torah because those two things are, are not the goals. Those are a means to an end. Okay, we'll stop there for a second. I'll, uh, anyone have any See if anyone has raised their hand in the raise your in the hand raise function on the thing here. Okay, I don't see anything, so I'll unmute Zach. Okay, go ahead, Zach. Um, I would like to explain why I brought uh, agricultural activity uh, uh, among those three things was necessary because we did have experience um, Israel living in Eretz Royal but they were shepherds, correct? Then when that time started, what was the first step of, of Hashem? He brought them to Egypt. What was the Egypt? It was an interesting example for those shepherds to see how nation can exist. They spent 400 years learning what is necessary for, for, for nation to exist. Hashem brought them by giving them opportunity to obtain the freedom, obtain their land, and obtain their new uh, social, social economic activities. And this considered as beginning because they could not do similar thing in a nation which has been remoted from all spiritual uh, um, goals that uh, we as a nation are supposed to achieve. I try to just uh, make emphasis that in in a, in a, uh, in a Rabbi Hirsch, uh, key word is nation versus two tribals. 
And this is a very important. Excellent. And since then, we never stopped to be a nation. Right. And Excellent. It was, okay. It was, so, it was so heavily embedded in us that even yeah. when we lost our land, we still right. continue to be a nation. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Zach. Okay, great. So that's uh, point number one with Zach's uh, additional comment. And now Rav Hirsch goes on to note something uh, as well. He notes something interesting. Let's go back to the psukim for a second. Um, he, he says, if we, if, we, if we look back at the psukim, where we, where we start to count, uh, he says, uh, he notes here in verse 15, you have it on the screen. We will count off seven weeks. But the word that the Torah uses for weeks is not Shavuot, it, it, it used, which is the, the, another option and which is actually used elsewhere. But here he uses the word Shabbatot. And Rav Hirsch is intrigued that the Torah uses the word Shabbatot to, to classify the counting of seven weeks from Pesach to Shavuot. What additional lesson are we learning by the use of the word Shabbatot? And Rav Hirsch says something beautiful. His, his, uh, I'll just set it up. We have to remember that we don't go directly from Yitzhak Mitzrayim, or let's say from Pesach to Shavuot, there's a, there's a buildup, right? There's a count, there's a period of time. And based on that, Rav Hirsch notes uh, as follows. He says here, then it goes on to teach that before the goal up to which this counting leads is reached, right? Before the goal, which is Shavuot, getting the Torah, before we can get the Torah, Sabbath, with its ever freshly recurring acknowledgement of God as the creator, Lord, and ruler of the world which man masters, and of the world which masters man, must have proved its educational and healing strength on us seven times. Seven times over the course of that period of counting from Pesach to Shavuot, we have a Shabbos. And every Shabbos, Hirsch, here we have an insight into how Rav Hirsch understands the, the message of Shabbos. The message of Shabbos is that despite the fact that we, on some level, rule over the world, right? we control the world, and that's what we're supposed to do. That's what God told us to do in, in the Garden of Eden, that we are supposed to subdue the world, and we are supposed to uh, try to achieve the greatest productivity for the world, while at the same time watching over, to, not to destroy it. We rule over the world, and sometimes the world rules over us. Every Shabbos, what are we reminded of? We're reminded that God is the real master. God as the creator, Lord, and ruler of the world. So we can't go from Pesach to Shavuot without this ethical, moral idea that we are not completely in charge, that God is in charge, and we do his will. Actually, this speaks to what Zach is saying, because on one level, as a nation, you know, one thing that nations claim, like I said before, is liberty. A nation can do whatever it wants, right? Every nation creates its own set of rules, and within those rules, it does whatever it wants, and it's not really beholden to an outside authority unless it chooses to. It makes a treaty or some pact or some agreement. But we're different, right? When we have, we have uh, a nation and we are, uh, we are governed not necessarily only by our own internal lawmaking, but we have, we have God to, to take into uh, consideration. So when we go from Pesach to Shavuot, when we go from nationhood to receiving the Torah, we have to be reminded, and here Rav Hirsch says, we're reminded of that seven times, that really God, that really God is the master. And it sort of, it sounds like it's almost tempering the, the, the liberty and the prosperity and recognizing, yes, that that liberty and prosperity is very, very important. But again, it needs to have an overlay of the message of Shabbat, which is God is uh, the ruler. And the laws of Shabbat, by the way, uh, fully, uh, I believe, support Rav Hirsch's understanding, right? The laws of Shabbat are that we are not allowed to engage in creative work, right? When we say not allowed to work on Shabbos, that's not enough of a definition of the word melacha, 
the Hebrew word melacha, which is in halachic context, what you're not allowed to do on Shabbat, a better translation of work would be creative work, right? We're not allowed to engage in creative work, meaning just planting a seed, which is so simple and so easy and, and almost effortless, that's an act of creation, which we're not allowed to do, we are not, uh, we are prohibited from doing on Shabbat because we are supposed to, we're not, we're, we're not supposed to exercise our creative power. Six days a week, we're supposed to exercise our creative power, but on, on, one, on one day a week, we're supposed to sort of step back and, and sort of remember uh, that God is, uh, that God is the, uh, is the ruler. And so Rav Hirsch continues, so that freedom and the basis of independence, possession of the land, must seven times have received their purification. I use tempered. So here it's purified and adjustment by Sabbath thoughts before we can be reckoned fit for the remembrance of that acquisition up to which the count needs. And in which accordingly, the freedom ensured by possession of the land is to regard as a true goal. So even, this is really interesting, even before we get the Torah, right, what's going on between Pesach and Shavuot? Between Pesach and Shavuot, historically, we did not have the Torah. So even before we get the Torah, we're reminded of what the Torah means, that God is in charge. How are we reminded of that? We're reminded of that by the seven times that we encounter Shabbos through, throughout the counting of the Omer. What our first seems to be saying is that Shabbos is a precursor of Matan Torah. That before receiving of the Torah, before we can receive the Torah, we have to, we have to be uh, seven times over uh, purified or tempered with the message of Shabbos. And this, Hirsch says, makes perfect sense. Because you remember, Hirsch reminds us that we got the mitzvah of Shabbos before we got the Torah. So not only does does theoretically, conceptually, the idea of Shabbos have to proceed getting the Torah so that we are ready to overlay our national existence with our uh, commitment to God, it actually, it did happen. And that's what Hirsch says here. For Sabbath is older than the Jewish nation. And in fact, it was the reintroduction of the Institute of Shabbat with its homage-paying act of shvitat melacha, stopping uh, creative work, and quite specially with the release, which this gives from the overpowering worry of providing food that preceded the giving of the law, and which was the preparatory education of the freed people to become people of God's law. What is he talking about? He's talking about uh, the idea uh, that we received uh, Shabbat, uh, some aspect of Shabbat uh, early on in Parshat Shalach. I'll show you those uh, psukim now. It's in Shemot 16. Let's go to Shemot 16. Okay, Shemot 16. This is the Jewish people traveling out of Egypt towards Eretz Yisrael. Let's say, and they started uh, complaining uh, about that. And then God, they start complaining that they have no food. And then what happens? Comes the, um, comes the man. And God says, what's the, what's, the, what's the rule of the man? You have to collect the double portion on Friday, but you're not allowed to collect on, uh, on Shabbos. So, so right off the bat, uh, uh, so our first says, if we consider what we remarked on Shemot 16, on the meaning of the Sabbath, of the manna, and which finds complete confirmation in the words with which Moses at the end of the wandering reflected on Israel having been fed with the manna, and its meaning for the faithful, the whole test of not collecting the man on Shabbos was a test to see whether the Jewish people were going to follow what, uh, what God said. So, uh, so the whole notion of Shabbos was given before 
the Torah, and the whole notion of what Shabbos is about was given before the Torah. So putting this uh, all together, right, we have a beautiful uh, uh, understanding of uh, of what's uh, of what's going on in these uh, in these psukim. We only count. We only start to count from Pesach to Shavuot after the first day of Pesach, once we've achieved our national liberty, and only once we've entered into Eretz Yisrael, once we've achieved a degree of prosperity, as Rav Hurst says, because, point one, the real purpose of prosperity and liberty is to achieve the, the, the other national goal, which is receiving of the Torah. So when other people and other nations would stop counting, we only start counting. When other people would say, Dayenu, that's good enough for me. I don't need anything else. We say, no, that's not. We need more than that. We don't only want, and now that's important to have liberty and prosperity, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, in terms of how the Rambam understands this. But that's not the, the goal. That's just a means to achieve the goal. And then we have to get some sort of education some sort of purification. Uh, so we, we don't, so we recognize that it's not all about uh, prosperity and national liberty, but that there's something else. And that's where the seven Shabbatot come. And that's why the seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot are called Shabbatot, as opposed to weeks, Shavuot, they're called Shabbatot, because Shabbos has a special lesson to teach us. And finally, conceptually, the idea of Shabbos comes before the getting of the Torah, but we see also actually the mitzvah or an aspect of the mitzvah of Shabbos came before the receiving of the Torah when God taught us to stand down on Shabbat morning when it comes to, uh, when it came to receiving uh, the month. So if we go uh, back just to the uh, psukim uh, that, we, uh, that we started with, uh, this week, this week's parshiot, this week's um, in Vayikra, uh, parshat Emor, right? So now it all it all makes a beautiful sense. Usfartem lachem imacharat haShabbat. We count after the first day of Pesach, after we've entered into Eretz Yisrael, after we've received this idea of Shabbos. All of those things, the things coming together to create this you know, beautiful spiritual picture of the purpose of liberty, the purpose of prosperity, and the, uh, the, the, the purifying idea of Shabbos. And, and, I, and, and I think it's, it's two points. Uh, I, actually, I'll, I'll take uh, Chana, and then uh, I will make a, a, closing, a closing point. So let me unmute uh, Chana. So first okay, of all, I, I wanted to say that whatever you taught us today, it's beautiful. And it reminds me the idea of Hanukkah uh, about the argument between Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel about lighting the candles, light one candle every night or the eight candles and go down. So the idea is that we are going toward Kabbalah Torah, so Ma'alim Bakodesh Velo So right, the right. seven Shabbatot bring us to high elevation of Gdusha. That's Beautiful. one thing. The other thing I wanted to ask you, I know the, I think I know the answer for sure, but I wanted to get it from you too. Uh, when Bnei Israel brought the Omer to Bet HaMikdash, Lemochorat HaShabbat, did, they brought it only one time, nachon? not every day until Shavuot. Correct, correct, so one it time. Was only, and the other thing that I wanted to ask you, and I think I also know the answer, but I want to be assured from you too, uh, so would you say that the amount of Omer is like a pound of Tvua, kind of? Ah, the, the actual uh, Amount. What weight. is Omer? How many, how many pounds, kind of? Right, okay. So let's see. Let's see if I can get the answer to that. Um, let's see, the Omer unit. The Omer, uh, let's see. The measurement was equivalent to four, 43.2 eggs, or what is also known as an attempt of an ifa. And dry weight, the Omer weighed one and a half kilograms. Oh. 
So it's like three pounds. Yeah. Okay, got One it. and a half to 1.7. That's oh, okay. what I see in a quick, a quick check here. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I never, okay. I always thought maybe it's one pound or something like that, but now close, it's more close. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, great. Sure. Okay. So just um, uh, two points to end with. One is the idea of Shabbat in, uh, that Hirsch is, is mentioning, that, um, of course, this is sort of the, the obvious idea of Shabbat, but sometimes it's good to be reminded that uh, when Shabbat comes, this is, this is our opportunity to think about what does it mean that we're not allowed to engage in melacha, that we're not allowed to engage in creative work. Uh, so it means uh, that what's the point of, of, cre of, of prohibiting creative work? And it, it's, so it's not just to have us rest. It's not just to, to, to free us to do other things, although that's important. It's to really uh, help us focus on the idea that as much as we are creative and as much as we are obligated to be creative, as much as we are obligated to participate in uh, in building in building the world, we once in a while, once a week, need to be reminded that um, uh, that um, that uh, um, God is really in charge, right? That not we we are not in charge. God is really in charge. Uh, we may not need that reminder this time during the coronavirus when we realize that as much as we thought we were in charge. Uh, we are not so much in charge and things happen which we have no control over. It's almost like we're living in a very, very three month long Shabbos where every single day we're reminded um, who's really in charge. Uh, and the second thing is um, to remember uh, that during this period of time when uh, we don't feel necessarily uh, so free and so in charge and we don't necessarily uh, feel 100% confident uh, in terms of uh, prosperity and how that's going to play itself out, uh, there is still the opportunity to focus on other things uh, and to recognize that all those other things are in the service uh, of God. And we hopefully those things will turn around and, and, and come back uh, strong as well. And in the meantime, we take the opportunity to uh, focus on spirituality, on, on God, on family, uh, and the, the insertion of, sh of the seven Shabbatot between Pesach and Shavuot is a reminder uh, to focus on other things. Uh, and I hope that uh, we're able to do that as well during this, uh, during this difficult time. So that is, uh, that's it. That's for, that's today's lesson. Anyone have any, uh, I'll unmute. Anyone have any thoughts or comments before we uh, say goodbye? Thank you, Rebbe. It was interesting. Thank you, Rabbi Gelman. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. All right. Thank everybody. you. Thank you, Rebbe. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Have, have a, a wonderful day. day. Have a great you day. Too. Again, I just want to uh, state one more time that today's class was sponsored by Jillian and Mike Davis. In memory of Mike's mother, Rose Sarah Davis, of blessed memory, whose yurt site was yesterday. Thank you for your sponsorship. Thank Have you. a wonderful day, everybody. Bye -bye. You too. Bye.